Hello everyone and welcome to this Adam Matthew digital presentation on transforming inquiry-based learning through the library. Thanks so much for your time today and being with us. My name is Ben Lacey and I'm joined by Nia Phillips, Maureen Mariansky and James Anthony Edwards. Nia is going to introduce the speakers, the session and some housekeeping very shortly. But first of all, I just wanted to provide a quick word about who Adam Matthew Digital are for those who are less familiar with our work. We partner with archives around the world to digitize their collections and present them online. These publications contain millions of pages of primary sources from the medieval era all the way to the 21st century. And today we're gonna to hear about how libraries can use collections like these to transform teaching and research. Thank you so much to RLUK for providing this uh, ability for us to present to you today and everyone um, at the conference who's put this on. It's been fantastic so far. And I'll now hand over to Nia to introduce our session. Thanks, Ben. Just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. I'm just going to apologise in advance. Today is the day that my neighbours have decided to have their roof repaired. So apologies for any banging that you might hear. Um, the joys of working from home, right? <laughs> Um, so yeah, briefly today, um, they'll introduce themselves as we go through the session, but these are today's speakers who'll be joining us. Um, so we have Maureen Mariansky, who's the Education and Outreach Librarian at the Lilly Library based at the Indiana University. Um, James Anthony Edwards, who's the University Librarian at the University of Exeter, who I'm sure many of you already know. Um, ben is our Head of Outreach at Adam Matthew Digital, and I'm the UK, Ireland, Nordics and Benelux Sales Manager here at Adam Matthew. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to Caroline Gale, who um, has worked on this session with us. Caroline was unable to attend today, but has been invaluable um, with the session and our, our wider work with Exeter. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you to Caroline. Um, so very briefly, the session outline for today, we'll be um, sharing a pre-recorded discussion um, with uh, Maureen from the Lilly Library. Um, obviously with Maureen being based at Indiana, we didn't want to get her up at the crack of dawn to join this. So we filmed this um, a couple of weeks ago with her. Um, we'll then follow on with a live discussion um, with James at the University of Exeter. Um, and finally, there'll be time for a live Q&A at the end. So if anybody does have any questions throughout um, the session, please do use the Zoom Q&A function rather than the chat, just so we can keep an eye on those questions and not lose any of them. Um, also, even though Maureen isn't attending today, if anybody does have any questions specifically for Maureen, please do still ask those questions, um, as Maureen has said that she's happy to answer any of those. Um, so we can kind of pass them on to Maureen and then, and then connect you with her. Um, similarly, if we run out of time at the end of the session, Ben and I are going to be at the Adam Matthew um, booth in the exhibit hall um, on kind of the joint live feature. So if you have any questions that you don't get um, answered during the session, please do pop by there after and we can answer them for you. Um, great. So we'll get started with that first um, pre-recorded discussion with Maureen. Um, so I'll hand over to Ben now, who's going to um, share that with you guys. Thanks all. I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Maureen Mariansky from the Lilly Library. The Lilly Library is the principal rare books, manuscripts and special collections library of Indiana University, Bloomington. Founded in 1960, it holds over 450,000 rare books and 8.5 million manuscripts, ranging from medieval manuscripts and early printed books to modern literary archives and mechanical puzzles. The Lilly is currently closed for a major building renovation that began in 2019 and is expected to reopen in late summer 2021. Maureen is the education and outreach librarian and coordinates the Lilly's extensive instruction program. Pre-pandemic, Lilly librarians hosted 200 to 250 class sessions and tours annually for IU undergraduate and graduate courses, as well as grade school and community groups. Maureen, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for your time. Uh, welcome to the session. Thank you, thank you for having me. No problem at all. If it's okay, can you start by outlining the type of instruction that you would have provided pre-pandemic, uh, including an overview of the primary sources immersion program, which is, I know, a significant part of your work? 
Absolutely, I'm happy to. Um, so the bulk of the Lilly Library instruction program and our whole approach to teaching with our collections um, is really based in active inquiry um, based learning. So very much wanting to get physical materials into the hands of students and allowing them to interact and engage directly with the materials um, has a lot to do with wanting to increase student engagement um, and also focusing on, you know, critical um, thinking skills and um, archival research skills. It's also grounded in uh, the history of the book and the book is an object. So the, the physicality, the materiality of our collections is, is, is really, really important. So thinking about how our items were created and used and then who created them, who used them, who collected them and how their evidence of lives lived. So we kind of infuse everything with um, encouraging uh, curiosity and lifelong learning um, and kind of breaking down the barriers um, and demystifying the spaces of special collections, libraries and archives um, and making them very welcoming, welcoming spaces um, for students. Um, a vital element of this kind of teaching, it, it takes a lot of partnership and communication with faculty members and with instructors. So that's, that's like a key component of all of this is, is the relationships that we build um, with instructors. So the primary source immersion program, um, we've done a few rounds of it. It started in 2017 and um, we've had three years. It's a grant program um, that my Lily colleagues and I working with um, colleagues in the IU Libraries Teaching and Learning Department, um, as well as the University Archives, uh, created this kind of three-day workshop program for um, instructors. Uh, it's open to faculty as well as graduate student instructors to redesign a course to into more closely integrate primary sources and the collections at IU um, into that particular course. So um, they go through a three day workshop in which we bring together um, repositories um, from across the IU campus. And this, I mean, th th this is not just the, the libraries. We have colleagues from the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, from the Kinsey Institute, from the Black Film Center. Um, so all of these colleagues coming together and, and sharing what kind of teaching they do with their collections and how they can um, partner and work with faculty. Um, and it's been a wonderful program for people to um, start building community around teaching with primary sources. Um, it's kind of an identified gap in formal training of, of, of learning to teach with primary sources and incorporate them into, in, into classes. So it's been a really nice, we've had great feedback from instructors about just how important and how wonderful it is to, to have, to bring people together from different disciplines and different repositories and they're able to learn from each other. And it can be a site of you know, professional networking but also um, exchange around uh, pedagogy. Sounds great. Sounds such a great program. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about how, you know, in the situation we found ourselves in in the past year, how you've managed to transform that you know, to an online environment? And you know, we talked a little bit about kind of the physicality being so important. How have you managed to kind of replicate that digitally? Absolutely. It's definitely been the challenge of the past year, um, job wise, at least um, for me. Um, it, and it's kind of compounded. So for us, the the challenge of the pandemic coupled with the challenge of our current renovation because our, our collections and our staff are kind of scattered across our campus um, has meant, for me, it's meant a lot of creativity. So those challenges, we've had to think very differently. So um, very reliant on, at first, <laughs> just photos we had taken of the collection in order to kind of uh, present them and, and talk to students about them, but also some of the materials that we've uh, digitized in-house um, as well as through databases uh, like Adam Matthew. Um, my philosophy the whole time has been uh, to try and come up with the simplest and easiest option, not just for me, but for students so that we don't wanna overcomplicate anything. We, wanna, we don't wanna throw up more barriers, right? Um, that, that we already have some that we're working with and, and kind of limitations. We don't need to, throw, we don't need to overcomplicate or overthink, right? So um, we've used Zoom a lot. We've used, we've wanted to make sure we can still get that active learning element into it. So um, we've utilized breakout rooms and, 
group work um, and kind of translating the activities that we had, trying to translate them into a virtual realm. And again, I've done it very simply with, uh, I use Google Docs and where the students can collaborate and kind of answer questions together um, in the group. And then I can kind of keep an eye on it and see if people are stumbling or is, is one room having issues and I can kind of address it from there. Um, and all of that is also then using links to either um, digitized materials in a database, uh, in-house digitized materials. Um, I recently did one with medieval manuscripts where I took all the pictures so you can see my hand in the pictures and things like that. But that's what we were able to give them. And so I have a folder of images for, for students to work from. So again, it's, you know, being just come up with a creative solution and kind of go with it. I've also had a lot of success with the, the Padlet program or um, tool. And um, that has been really wonderful because um, I'm, I'm able, students again can kind of collaboratively comment on, on images and I kind of streamline and simplify all of the activities and the questions that I'm asking students. Um, and yes, the materiality, the, the physicality, that has been a huge part of figuring out how to teach this year. Um, and one of the solutions that we've kind of come up with is, is using a document camera. And so since we do have access as staff members into our building, we've been able to go in and just set up with a document camera. And so I'll have students work with the digitized materials and we come back for discussion and I will have the physical materials and they can at least see me manipulate the, the materials and give them a sense of size and scale and put it under the document camera, zoom in where we need to, and kind of just start having the conversation about what is gained, what is lost with digitization and kind of the comparison between digital surrogate and the physical item. Um, so that's kind of been my approach for this year. It sounds uh, fascinating actually trying to deal with those challenges and yeah, rising to them as well, which is really good to see and being able to maintain that element of the physicality and just getting students thinking about what is this item? How has it been saved and preserved? And then uh, maybe kind of connecting that with the digitized surrogates as well, um, which is really good to see. Uh, so you did touch on uh, very briefly there about the role of digitized archival collections within that instruction as something that you point to um, as part of it. Can you say a little bit more about that and the role that digitized archival collections play? Absolutely. Um... I mean, it's, they're vital. I, I wouldn't be able, I don't think I'd be able to teach in any really meaningful and active way without having access to digitized materials, whether they're um, digitized in-house or we're working through a database. Um, I'll mention I'll I'll mention an Adam Matthew database. Um, I I actually I use it a lot and I've used it a lot in my own research too. Is is the London Low Life mm. collection and you know I've worked with a wonderful. We have these uh, intensive freshman seminars um, that happen a couple weeks before the the start of the fall semester and it's extraordinary. It's about twenty incoming freshmen. So not only are they new to the Lily and we're introducing them to everything they could potentially use at the Lily, they're new to IU, they're new to college. Um, so, so it's an extraordinary opportunity. And we have a class that comes in all the time and it, we happen to use a lot of London low life material and have the physical items. And this time around, one of the things that has been challenging is because of the pandemic plus renovation-ness of it all. Um, usually when I end a class session, I'm like, and come back. Like if there's something you've seen, come and explore it and you can come to our reading room. And you, all you need is curiosity to come access all this, these materials. And I don't have that kind of hook that I can leave them with. And what I was able to do for this is I introduced them, you know, I introduced them to a specific item, the, the swells guide, and I had it physically for them to look at. And then they were able to explore the digitized version in breakout rooms. And then when I left them, I was able to say everything in this database is from the Lily library. And I know you can't handle it in person, but you can explore and, and, and all of these different materials um, in the database. And that's been really important. And I, I'm not always able to do that with every subject area. So it was nice to have that opportunity with that class and that collection. That's really exciting. I, 
and especially because it was a freshman class. I think that um, I'm really struck by that because sometimes people are a bit hesitant about using archival collections or primary sources generally with first year undergraduates. So did they react quite positively to that experience? Oh, absolutely. It's, um, oh, it was one of the best virtual sessions that I've had. They were so enthusiastic. I actually, I very much underestimated the amount of engagement and how much they would talk. This is another thing that I have come to realize over the last year is in the virtual realm because they can ask questions in the chat and they don't necessarily have to unmute. They don't necessarily have to physically speak. Um, students are very chatty and they have a lot of questions and I love it. Um, and th this was one of those examples and they were just so enthusiastic and so thrilled. Um, and we're really lucky. We have some, we have amazing faculty um, at IU and a lot who, who, who specifically work with first or second year uh, students um, and really advocate for them being able to come in and, and use our materials. I mean, it's open to them regardless, but it's sometimes it's that intimidation, unfamiliarity issue of, of kind of getting them in the door and getting them to, to work with the collection. So to bring them in very early in their college career, it can kind of set the tone, not just for their four years, but you know, I'm again, I'm a big advocate of lifelong learning and that this isn't just about the research paper you're writing. This is about how do you approach and critically examine these spaces and these materials and cultural heritage and how does this enrich lives, right? So um, I kind of see that as like, yeah, bring them in first year. Let, let's start having some conversations. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I love that. And so nice to see that you know, actual virtual learning environment has, you know, enabled students that may be a bit cautious, you know, about raising their hand and kind of getting involved to, to really engage in that way. And that's, you know, definitely one of the positives from the last year. Would you say are there are any other kind of positives that you found from the last year or maybe things that you would, you know, continue post, um, you know, when we're back in, back in person and, you know, when the restoration's finished and kind of those, those roadblocks are, are removed? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, my the biggest takeaway for me is a spirit of creativity, like I was talking about, and also experimentation. So by necessity, that's, we've had to kind of embrace that um, this year, but it's been kind of, I was talking to a colleague about this the other day. It's weirdly um, increased my confidence in, in my ability to do, because I've had to kind of deconstruct what I've done so so for, for several years in person I've had to really deconstruct it and rethink a lot of things and and I don't know it's been kind of freeing um and it, it's also I'll go back to kind of talking about partnerships with faculty I think it's made those stronger I have you know faculty members I've worked with several times you know we've kind of had to go back to the drawing board and be like okay how are we gonna figure out a, a way that is engaging and, and exciting and uh, meaningful for students. Um, and, and fair play to them. They've been amazing <laughs> in terms of like, I don't know, let's just try something. So I love that spirit because I think, um, I think it's very easy to like find a one way of doing something and you just kind of keep, keep, keep doing it and you don't assess and take in the feedback. And I think that's a vital element of this kind of teaching and, and any kind of teaching that teaching is a practice and you're constantly, you know, taking in the feedback and assessing what you've done and making changes and adjustments. And sometimes they're big and sometimes they're small. Um, so yeah, for me, that kind of creativity, uh, experimentation, flexibility um, has been, has been really key. I think the technology aspect of it too, I've never really um, this kind of goes along with the renovation um, because we are going to have new and updated technology in our classrooms and we haven't had that. We really haven't had the capacity, even if I'd wanted to, um, I think, to incorporate some technology. So I'm excited to see like um, using a document camera in an in-person class and maybe we can zoom in and, and really focus on certain details or have a different kind of conversation where everyone can kind of see the item on the screen instead of trying to crowd around, which for some items, if it's really tiny, that's not always possible. Um, so I'm excited to kind of take what I've learned technology wise and see how it, how it could translate back into the in-person environment. Um, and then just from like a more, I don't know if this is a more personal 
um, uh, point of view. Um, the there's a wonderful the teaching with primary sources community and um, collective website um, that is kind of a national community of librarians and archivists and cultural heritage professionals uh, who teach with their collections. Um, very early on last year, we were able to start having like community calls and support each other. So there's there's just been a lot of community building and just again, a lot of ge generosity and support and experimentation and, and willingness to, to share information and share knowledge and help each other. And I, I hope to see that continue. And, and I'm, pre I'm pretty confident we're, we're all very adamant. We want that to continue. So we're gonna kind of fight for that, I think. That sounds really positive. And um, yeah, what a good takeaway to have from a very difficult year and a very challenging year for lots of people. And that community element, I think, really speaks to the fact that library professionals across the world have really risen to that challenge and uh, performed amazing feats uh, under very challenging conditions. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Maureen. That's been fantastic. And uh, I'm sure that people will be interested in your work. And maybe if we have some questions, we can uh, direct them your way as well so that the conversation can continue. Absolutely. I'd be happy to, to talk with, with anyone. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. We'll now move on to the live section and live discussion. So I'll hand over to Nia for that. Thanks, Ben. And welcome, James. Thank you very much for joining us today and for taking the time. Um, I'm sure lots of the people attending today are already familiar with you and the, the library at Exeter. But just to kind of kick us off, could you briefly introduce the library and your role um, at the university? So I'm university librarian. Um, university of Exeter Library is an interesting one. Um, the, the bit I'm responsible for is, well, let's start with the university. The university's got three main campuses, two in Exeter City, one in Penryn, just on the outskirts of Falmer. Um, and so we split our operations across quite a big distance, which is relevant to what we'll talk about after. I'm responsible for what happens in Exeter the kind of overall approach and what happens digitally because we do obviously for all our students they get everything digitally and then the the Cornwall campus is is a shared campus with Falmouth University which gives it a very different feel to the Exeter campus but it has that shared research-led learning approach. Um, in terms of the library service we're um, fairly similar to a lot of kind of research intensive library services. And the only difference which a lot of people have heard me banging on about is we have a very, very small team indeed. Um, but we have we have your usual run of modern collections. We have some really strong special collections, um, which we'll come to, but in areas like Southwest Writers. So we have the manuscripts of Lord of the Flies. We have Daphne du Maurier's papers, a really strong Middle East collection. We also have a fantastic digital humanities lab and digital humanities team, which 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 is very, very, we're keen on matrix management at Exeter. And the Digital Humanities Lab is very matrix managed. So I manage the head of digital humanities, but also in that team are IT people, technical services people, um, and academics from humanities. So we, we, we spread ourselves across um, most areas and you know, like everyone else, take the lead on things like research data and open access. But yeah, we, we, we cover two counties um, as well as people in countries all over the world. Thanks, James. It's a small task then. <laughs> um, something that we've been speaking about quite a lot is the library's 21st century research library project. Could you tell us a little bit more about that project and kind of where it came and came from and kind of where you're at at the moment? Sure. So this this was well, it's, it's been a five year project. It's got about four months left to run. And it came out of our previous research strategy, which, again, is just coming to an end. Um, one of the things I should have said about Exeter is we're very much a transition point at the moment because our previous VC, Steve Smith, who a lot of people have known from his UK work and things, retired last summer and we had a new VC, Lisa Roberts. So we've got a lot of, not only because of COVID, because of new senior leadership, we've got a lot of change coming. Um, but the previous research strategy had a, a set of funding with it. And the kind of, I, I, I mean, it wasn't in post at the time, but it kind of, the bit that was seen as the humanities element was this 21st century research project, research library project. It's got three different elements to it. The, the smallest, the least developed, but potentially one of the ones that really needs some looking at 
is around linking the university archive into local archives. And there've been some workshops, but there's with our with our civic university commitment, there's there's real potential to do more with that element. And I think that's one we're gonna have to look at more. The two bits which had money, which is the bit that always makes things work, um, were investment in primary sources and investment in our special collections. Um, I'll touch on special collections first and then I'll come to the primary sources. So our special collections team before this, I think had about three people in it um, and we doubled it. Um, it the, the total funding, not just for the staffing, but for the resources was about one and a half million over five years, but it, it varied across time as to when that money came in. Um, but those, those project catalogers uh, were working on Middle East collections. They were working on the archives of the Northcott Theatre, which is the, the largest theatre in Exeter. And they're working on a charity called Common Ground who do lots of arts and environmental stuff, cataloging those collections, um, blogging about them, doing social media. It, it made a big difference because we had such a tiny team that putting that many people in means we've been able to look at archives accreditation, we've upped our social media presence. Um, so it's been a real shot in the arm. The other element was investment in primary sources. And back at the, about the start of the project, we did a benchmarking exercise um, across all the colleges saying, you know, essentially, if you could have what you wanted out of the library, what are we missing? And the bill was about 11 million pounds in 2015 prices. Uh, we haven't quite managed to do that, but what we have had, and it, it varies year by year, but we've ended up with about 300,000 a year to spend on primary sources, we we target all colleges. Um, so it's it's predominantly humanities, social sciences, but we have humanities people in our social sciences college. We have humanities and social sciences people in our business school. Geographers have been have been buying things. What that's really done is to, the special collections arm was a big shot in the arm directly for special collections. But what the twenty first century library funding has done is really gives a fresh direction. This all started under my predecessor, Claire Pound, who really took us down a much more digital route than we had been before. And 300,000 a year to spend is, is good, but what it's really done is enable us to open up additional funding. Um, so, you know, one of the things we did uh, summer 2019 was to buy the Adam Matthew Complete. So we, we were first in Europe to get everything that you publish. The way we paid for that was using the 21st century library money, but also then using that to draw on library funding and to get QR funding out of Humanities College. So it's really been, it's been a shot in the arm. We spend a lot more than we get from the project on primary sources. Um, so that, that's broadly the three elements. This, this smaller regional archive engagement piece, um, a real increase in what we're doing about special collections and that's flowed through to teaching and research and then real investment in primary sources the whole thing was structured as a research funded project so it had to be about the benefit for research but we have obviously seen the benefit for education as well because you you don't do one without the other and we've seen the best use come from people who use them for both it's great it's such an amazing project and you know really nice that you've got those three different arms and kind of focuses to it um obviously you're kind of coming to the end of the project now but how would you say that the project and the work of the project and you know having those extra resources and that extra funding would you say that it's put extra in a particularly good stead for the the challenges that we've been experiencing over the last kind of year um and could you tell us a little bit more about uh, where you go next you know what happens you know, in the next few months once, once the project has ended? Sure, so I think taking the special collections part um, to start with, that was essentially about cataloging young catalog collections. That's had a big payoff because I, yeah, we've invested probably 500,000. On the back of it, the Northcott Theatre got 175,000 pound Arts Council grant, um, which we've got some of the funding from to do further work around their history. But we're also looking at a big, about one and a half million pound digitization project for the Middle East collections, which are one of our real strong points. So it's really helped lever in additional funding. And if there's one thing that DVC research is like, it's it's spending money and getting more money on the back of it. Um, and then, I mean, the primary sources, the primary sources have always been really important. You know, the, the Cornwall campus that I talked about is two and a half hours from Exeter. 
Now, if you think how far Exeter is from everywhere else in the country, two and a half hours from Exeter is just like, you know, go over the Tamar, keep going. You know, it's, 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 it's a lovely place, but it's a long way from anywhere. And so being able to tell potential PhD students and researchers that we have access to these collections, they don't have to go to London to get them. That's been a real boon and it's really paid off um, during COVID. And it's made a big difference to dissertation subjects. Yeah, we, we, we have a very small, it's about £5,000 a year fund to pay travel costs for students, undergrads and PGTs to go to other libraries. And, and obviously nobody's been doing that, but they've been able to get access to the primary sources and structure their research around it. So I, I think we really would have struggled because we don't have quick and easy routes to get elsewhere for primary material. Um, and I think what we will see is even those people who chose to go to London because actually they quite like to go to the BL and then do a bit of shopping on the back of it, will in future just be staying in extra a bit more. Great, yeah, I can't <laughs> can't uh, discredit train links and the importance of that, right? <laughs> um, yeah, really great to hear that. You know, it's really opened up different pathways for students who you know wouldn't be able to get get access to that that content normally, or you know, especially especially in the last year. Um, and so, yeah, I guess you know, thinking about the pandemic again, would you say that that's had any impact on kind of the next steps for the project? Has it kind of informed some of the decisions that you'll be making around what happens next once the project ends, or kind of just firmed up some of the decisions that you'd already made around? I that? I think I think the pandemic has probably highlighted some of the things we need to do next. So the areas that I'm I'm really looking at are particularly so. Special collections, we already know that our big issue is digital archives. And we've got a big, big issue around digital preservation. And the pandemic has helped us with that because now everybody is much more aware of data. We've got a better way in and we've just done a piece of work around our whole research data management piece. So it's helped with that. But around primary sources, the areas I'm really looking at next are how do we integrate? And it was really interesting to hear, um, you know, the, the, the last set of integrations that talked about that, how do we bring our primary source bought collections closer to our, our special collections? Um, decolonization is big on our list. Um, and that we're, we're hoping to get some funding for a project across the colleges and the primary sources will be, will be part of that. And then the other one that we're working on at the moment is for our digital humanities, um, and not just our digital humanities lab, but for digital humanities generally in the university, we're working on a new strategy. And the big question there is, what does digital humanities education look like? So one of the things I'm going to be looking for is how do we integrate the primary source collections into digital humanities education? So it isn't simply, here's access to primary sources, this is how you interpret a primary source, but actually how do you get under the skin of that and you really do that, that digitally enabled research, saying, so, you know, how do we support our students to learn text and data mining? Uh, we've got real strengths in 2D and 3D imaging. We've got real strengths in geolocation. How do we bring those in? How do our primary source collections relate to what we've created in-house? Um, some of which is digitization of other people's items, some of which is digitization of our own collections. So there's, there's real potential there to really shake up our digital humanities education. And that's, that's a very, very live conversation at the moment really exciting yeah it'd be really great to get that you know more students and kind of more undergraduates involved in in that type of work um speaking about kind of the students kind of element of it and you know you mentioned that you know obviously extra the the first university in europe to kind of access to the entire adam matthew portfolio um could you tell us a little bit more and kind of maybe some feedback from some of the teams that you know in your um department about how having access to that material has transformed transformed the the library the learning experience of um the students and the library's patrons again apologies for the banging in the background I, it, it's made it's made a huge difference i mean the feedback from the academics is is often around third year students, dissertations, um, the best ones have built it into their, into their courses, um, but it really helps those students who want to stretch themselves um, to step off the reading list and really go and dig into things for themselves. So I think we found, it, you know, 
our, our whole thing, our, our education strategy talks about a research education ecosystem. And that's exactly what this is about. It, it's, it's helping those students who want to push themselves that bit further to be able to go and do that original research. And, and from, a, from a selfish longer term point of view, you know, the more we can excite them with that, we can turn undergrad students to postgrad taught students, we can talk postgrad taught students into PGRs, and we can keep them with us an extra because they know they'll have the resources they need. Some of the ways we've supported them to do that is we use LibGuides heavily. I mean, I've touched on the staffing bit and I won't, I won't, you know, drum it, but the way the way we responded to what is a 43% reduction in staffing over about seven years is to go very, very digital. So we use LibGuides really heavily. So we have themed LibGuides for our primary sources around country, around date, around format, and then around theme. Um, and then we have, yeah, we have a kind of a LibGuide for the Adam Matthew collection. So we we try and give people multiple ways into the sources, um, and that that seems to be working really well. And in many ways, the pandemic has made that a little bit easier. So the liaison team have found it easier to teach over Teams um, than they did previously. And we had a whole discussion when we went into lockdown. You know, do we need to provide rooms at two meter distance to deliver face to face teaching? And the end, we said, you know, it's just a lot easier. Everybody's got Teams. Let's just go to Teams, and and we have done, and it's it's made a big difference. Um, that's really interesting, and actually, following on from that, if I can uh, jump in, um, I was actually going to ask about any advice that you would have for library liaison teams or people who are working on that instruction side at the library for embedding primary sources, including digitized primary source content, into research led teaching. I guess you've touched on some of that with the LibGuides, but if you could speak to that a bit more, I think it'd be interesting. I, I think the, the, the biggest part of it is the engagement. So the way we go about choosing these is the whole project has a steering group, which is chaired by one of our history profs. Um, and Caroline, who would have been here, but for the fact she's off work, writes out to every college, um, to say, you know, it's time to tell us what you want again. And we end up with a big wish list. This year's wish list is about two million pounds worth. Um, so it is a it is a wish list. And more than that, you will get everything on here. But I think going out and talking to the academics about what they want, and they can't just say, we want this. They have to say, we want this and this is why. Because then there's a kind of shortlisting scoring process and the steering group agree, okay, we'll buy this, we'll buy this. And then we get into negotiations. Okay, where do we pull in library funding? Can we get any other money from the colleges? But I think that early engagement in people thinking about what they want and why they want it really helps. And we have seen one or two resources. There have not been a lot where somebody's written in saying, we really want this resource. This will be amazing. It's got all this stuff. And then we send them the price tag and they go, yeah, it's really amazing, but thanks, not at that price. Um, you know, I mean, we, we have literally had people, and this was pre-pandemic, we have literally had people say, actually, maybe we could send people to London for, for really quite niche resources. But generally, our approach has been to, to accumulate those requests. I mean, as we did, we've had a Matthew complete. Yeah, we had a number of requests that year and actually went, you know what? We're going to be better off buying everything rather than buying little bits. And that's generally been our approach. We tend to go in, you know, it's like in for a penny, in for a pound. Um, and we just find better value because with ebooks, with print books, we can do interlibrary loan. We can't do interlibrary loan of the Brotherton's literary manuscripts because Masood, in his new job, would not let me stick them in roll mail and send them down the country. Um, so it's, it's really helped us. And actually having that choice there Trying to trying to tailor it to the research we know is happening, the education we know is happening, but also being able to let people explore new areas just means that people keep coming back in for more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there you go. There's a, a challenge for any special collections teams uh, out there about uh, transporting documents. Um, so you've got that great system in place for analysing what the kind of research and teaching needs are. Can you then tell us about the ways the library helps promote and raise awareness of digital archival collections once they've been purchased and especially with helping faculty find the most appropriate for their use? 
Yeah, so again, we run a lot through the lib guides and through engagement on the education side with directors of education um, and again using our liaison team to go out and talk to people and to push through those kind of those channels. It's been a lot harder during the pandemic. Yeah, the pandemic has been largely focused on getting the reading lists done. Yeah, that's been this year's focus, but previously just being able to go out and talk to people. And because this is, I mean, I came in to year three of a five year project. Um, so it already had a good track record. It had that name recognition. Um, but we have pushed people talk about what we've got, academics talk about what they've got. And that, that word of mouth has helped. Um, one of the things we'd like to do more of is being able to get out to new academics and say, this is what we've got. And again, there's a, there's a capacity question. There's a perennial, how do you know when a new member of staff has started question. Um, yeah, there are there are ways, and what we try and do is make it as clear as possible to everybody what's there. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Um, we concluded the recording with Maureen by asking about any positives that she had to take from the past year. So I wonder if we could put the same question to you um, and ask if there's any elements that you'll be retaining and taking forward post COVID. I, I think the the shift to doing a lot more on teams will be here to stay. Um, certainly for liaison, certainly for our open research team. We we won't be stopping doing face to face, but the whole university, like every university, has to work out its balance of online, face to face, hybrid, what have you. Um, I think the pandemic has made. We were already there with digital. We had until. A couple of years ago, the biggest collection of ebooks in the Russell Group, uh, and then Edinburgh went and bought a load. Um, so I've stopped saying we have the biggest load of collection in the Russell Group, and I now say size doesn't matter; it's whether they get used, because um, that that is that is one of our one of our real areas of focus will be on how do we develop the collection in effective ways? How do we provide something that's distinctively extra? It's a real challenge around digital resources. Because once upon a time, you could have a massive physical library and replicating that library meant getting hold of a load of books that probably weren't available and building a big enough building. Now, if anyone wants to replicate what we've done, they just need to, I say just, but yeah, they need to persuade their university to open up the purse strings. And actually the rest of it is very easy. Yeah, it, it's, it's a simple matter of saying, yep, yeah, we'll have that sort out the license and away you go. So this isn't something that can't be replicated. Um, but it's it's something that we find real advantage from, and it's we've just had a new associate dean research in humanities. Um, he was head of um, languages, and he's super excited and dead keen. Um, so this has got real backing, and I think the special collections bit as well has been transformative for the attitude towards special collections. They were a bit underloved; um, they hadn't had the resourcing, and actually seeing the benefits will help with the next stage, which is trying to work out how to build them an entirely new building because they've run out of physical space. Yeah, I, I really like to hear that because special collections are so important. And I think sometimes they are seen as a separate part of the library. And it's really good to think about uh, the library as an entire system of support for research and teaching. And I think maybe that's sometimes where it gets uh, missed off. So that's really good to hear. Thanks so much, James. Uh, that's all of the questions that we had for you. Obviously, we do want to turn over to the Q&A uh, as well, if that's OK. Um, a couple of comments in the chat. First of all, though, uh, Masood agreeing with James about the importance of um, things being used and, and having these collections is only useful if they're being used. I'm going to make a shameless plug for the outreach team, at Adam Matthew at this stage and say that is very much what we are all about. It's our entire remit is to work with librarians in order to um, increase awareness and use of collections that are most relevant to faculty and students. So please do get in touch if you have any requests or you would like us to share tips because this is how I know Maureen, for example, is um, delivering sessions for the primary source immersion program for Indiana. So we, uh, we like to um, help out with that integration and that use. Um, so if we turn over to the Q&A and um, James, if it's okay to start, 
you mentioned investing in people right at the start of your piece and we heard quite a bit yesterday about the importance of investing in people as well as resources so uh, do you think that the connections you were talking about between research and teaching um, digital humanities and special collections how does investing in people help with that um, if you're okay to answer that one yeah i mean you you can't do it without um I, I talked about the Digital Humanities Lab and I talked about Digital Humanities and that's the best way to unpick this. People see we made a lovely investment in the lab, but actually the lab is the people. Yeah, you, you buy the cameras, we build our strong rooms. It's, it's all great, it's a lovely space, but actually if you haven't got people who know what they're doing and it's people who really know what they're doing, that's, that's where it happens. So we've seen real, real gain, and partly through the pandemic, the, the lab has been digitizing special collections material. That's helped the links between special collections and DH. Um, and just trying to break down some, you know, there, there are, it's, it's a small campus relatively, but everybody works in different buildings. So trying to get people to see each other more often um, is a big part of it. And acknowledging where different people have different skills and pointing out that actually the expertise is helpful. So, you know, you don't just want to go and take a picture um, on a scanner if you've got a lab that's got the capacity to do it for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you've kind of uh, answered a little bit of uh, a second question, um, which is about integrating primary source material into digital humanities specifically and whether you've got any good starting points to make this happen. So, um, yeah people is the starting point, but any other tips that you've got? People is the starting point, but digital humanities has, has a real challenge. And there, there's a question with digital humanities, particularly around research, is are you researching the academic discipline, let's say classics, or are you researching digital humanities? So by and large, what we'll be talking about is how to incorporate digital humanities into, let's say classics. So starting with the discipline and really making it relevant to that discipline is the way to go. So you, you, you know, one of our research fellows in DH is an epigrapher. So she works on Roman inscriptions. She could incorporate her work into, into an education module. And that, that is really the starting point is making it relevant to students. You can give them those employability skills. You can give them the data skills, but you start with what's in the module. And if it's relevant to the academics, they're much more likely to take it up. Otherwise, what you end up with is a DH bolt on sitting on one side, which some people take and some people don't. And we had a liberal arts module this year, which didn't get as much take up as we can. And we think some of that was the inability to kind of market because of the pandemic and that. Um, but it's that it's really integrating it into what people are doing is where is is the place to start um, and giving people the skills. So we have a small team, but we also have a lecturer um, with a DH background um, who he does criminal history, I think. Um, and he's done great stuff with some of our resources. Um, but I think it, it is it is building into the curriculum. Yeah. Um, to actually to follow on from that, if it's okay for me to provide a little bit of an answer from my perspective as well, there's a couple of liberal arts colleges in Pennsylvania that I've um, done a little bit of work with, but it's very much driven by them. I don't want to take credit for any of this, uh, but the libraries there have an internship program that runs each summer where they get undergraduate students in. Um, they're, they're paid, it's a proper paid internship. It's a six to 10 week program, and they are there to be trained on digital humanity skills by experts at the library, uh, but also to run their own DH project using primary sources that are available through the library that might be in special collections it might be in digitized collections and the idea is that they then go and act as champions in the classes that they take part in so if a faculty member I mean these are small liberal arts colleges so it's maybe a little bit easier to do I don't know how it would scale up but if a class um, are being instructed on a particular subject they've then actually got undergraduate students in that class who can act as champions for knowing who to contact at the library, knowing what might be possible, knowing how to bring primary sources and DH together. And I really like that as a kind of student-led model. Um, and yeah, um, again, I can provide details of 
contacts for anyone who wants to hear more. And that was going to be my second shameless plug. Uh, Adam Matthew do actually have a webinar coming up in April on digital humanities using Adam Matthew collections. So if you'd be interested in finding out about our policies around that, about the fact that you can request exports of all of the mess data and full text data from your Adam Matthew collections, uh, and also some case studies of projects that have uh, used that data in the past, um, please do have a look out for that, get in touch with us, uh, and we can send you a link to that because, um, yeah, we're really keen to support this kind of work using primary sources. Um, any, sorry, James, anything else yeah, to add? Yeah, I was going to say that, I mean, our lab wouldn't function. When you walk into our lab, into the DH lab, the first person you will see is, a, is an undergrad. Um, so we have a, an annual round of interns. We have, we call them graduate business partners, you know, kind of 18 month post-graduation contracts as well. And they really get stuck in on, they often move from intern to that, to that graduate business partner role. Um, and they're, they're, they learn all the techniques and they, they help run the lab with the lab manager. Same is true in special collections, and, and that's been a real challenge for this year, is bringing in interns. And the beauty of digital humanities and special collections is you can give them work to do remotely. Um, we're looking forward to getting them back on campus because we need to get them actually sitting in the archive working on the physical electrons, but it'll come. Um, there's what, uh, sorry, Neil, I feel like I'm kind of dominating the Q&A. So do, do jump in if, uh, if you want to take over at any point. I certainly don't mean to. Sorry about that. No, um, no problem at all. I was just going to say I popped a link in the chat to where you can pre-register for that webinar um, around digital humanities that Ben mentioned. So if there's anybody that's interested in attending that, um, that's in the chat now. Um, we've got about five, six minutes left. So if there is kind of any final thoughts that you wanted to share, James, anything that we perhaps haven't had a chance to cover that you really wanted to speak to? Um, something you want to share now? I'll just pick up Jeremy's point about discovery. Discovery is a, I mean, discovery is a challenge um, because really what we are looking to make discoverable are those things we've digitized ourselves, which we don't really have a platform for at the moment. There's a whole other conversation to be had. Um, those things which are freely available, so that might be you know, research grant funded stuff, the Parker Library at Corpus, things like that. And then, and then the bought digitized collections, which you know, because we buy from different providers have different interfaces and platforms. And, and yeah, discovery, discovery is a challenge across all of those um, because there isn't one single route in. I think for researchers like with everything, it's a bit easier because they tend to know where to go. And, and building that in for, for the taught students is that little bit harder. But at the end of the day, if we get them to the right resources and give them the, the skills to find them themselves, then we'll get them there. Um, but yeah, dis discovery, is a, discovery is a real challenge um, and one that you know, we'll, we'll keep working on. I, I think for me, there are, particularly around the stuff that we do, you know, we look to open standards and things um, because then we can pull in data from elsewhere. But we do small volume stuff. We don't do large scale, you know, the things that Adam Matthew do, we wouldn't do because we don't have the scale or capacity. We focus on individual items type things. Um, I think final thoughts. I, I think it's been really, really important for Exeter making this investment. I mean, it's, it's transformed our special collections. It's, it's really set them up. Yeah, we know now um, for reasons that I do not understand the project funding has turned into permanent funding. So I now need to turn my mind to what happens forever and ever. Um, but we will carry on with the investment in primary sources. Yeah, they are well built into the way we operate. And we'll look at how to bring special collections much more into that picture and what the future looks like. I suspect the next one is the University Archive, um, which is sitting in a grotty basement waiting to be loved. Um, amazing. Thank you, James. And thank you also to people who've been making comments in the chat. Uh, James highlighted a few of those, but uh, Katie and Nadine, thank you so much for your positive comments as well. And yeah, we're huge advocates for undergraduate champions and many of the other things that were discussed. So look forward to continuing that conversation in future with everyone after the conference.